Okay. Well, let's get this party started. I'm Father Timothy Matkin, and this is Matins, and I'm glad you've joined us. We're continuing our little series here on purgatory and the Anglican view on such things. Um, last time we wrapped up the study of Bicknell's commentary on the 39 articles, and uh, article, I think it was 22, uh, that touches on the subject. This time, we will go into the analysis from Francis J. Hall. He is the professor of dogmatic theology at General Theological Seminary back in the early 1900s, and he wrote a multi-volume series, I think 10 volumes, called Dogmatic Theology, which covers pretty much everything. <laughs> And uh, in fact, when it was released, uh, it was dubbed the Anglican Summa, uh, which shows you how uh, significant and monumental it is. And th there's really nothing else like it. And uh, he's very good at walking you through these things and also doing so in a way that is not going to go over your head. It's, it's accessible to the typical layman, um, especially those who want to apply themselves and, <clears throat> and walk through points bit by bit. Before we get there, we're going to have our opening prayer, and as, as we have done before uh, in our study on the subject, we want to turn to the burial rites and look at some of the prayers there. So this will be the prayer um, at the committal, uh, the actual burial part, not the church funeral part, but at the graveside, and uh, following the putting the body in the ground or in the uh, uh the, the niche in the columbarium or, or whatever the case is, and uh, the prayer that accompanies that. Then you have the Lord's Prayer, and then you have this. Let us pray. Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of those who depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and felicity, we praise and magnify thy holy name for all thy servants, who, having finished their course in faith, do now rest from their labors and committing our brother or sister, and the, you give the name, to thy gracious keeping. We pray that together with him and with all those who are departed in the true faith of thy holy name, we may have our co perfect consummation and bliss, both in body and soul, in thine eternal and everlasting glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So it was touching on some things that we've mentioned before. Uh, it puts heavy stress on the idea of the communion of saints, the fellowship of all the departed with the living through Christ and in Christ. And it uh, turns uh, memento mori, be mindful of your own mortality, and uh, praying that we would find our perfect consummation and bliss along with them in Christ. It says that uh, for thy faithful people, uh, the afterlife is um, not one of uh, being shut out from God's presence, but moving to God's nearer presence uh, and enjoying that joy and felicity that comes thereby. If you are listening to this on Apple or Spotify, please give us a review so we can uh, get noticed and please uh, share this program. If you think it's important, if you like it, um, share it with other people so they can get to know it as well. Share it on uh, your social medias like uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and so on. And uh, give us a like, and uh, you can hit the bell if you want to get notified when we go live, which is typically um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, as long as I'm available, about uh, 8.15, 8.20. And if you'd like to write to me, you can comment down below on YouTube, or you can send me an email at frmatkin at priest.com. So we're going to turn to Francis Hall, Dogmatic Theology. So this it will be Volume 10. So we're coming to the end, to the afterlife, to issues related to that. Um, and so the, the volume is entitled es Eschatology, End Things. And this concludes his series. Um, let's see, when was it published? This one was published in 1922, so it uh, wrapped up the series. And uh, interestingly that the, the volume is dedicated to Thomas Aquinas. So it's dedicated as completing this series of dogmatic theology to the blessed memory of Thomas Aquinas, the greatest constructive theologian of Christian ages. And so that gives you an insight into Hall himself, that he is a, a Thomist 
and that he likes the, the very meticulous and systematic mind of Thomas Aquinas. So we're looking at the section, uh, the chapter called uh, Perfecting of Souls. Wait, no, this is chapter 3, uh, entitled The Other World, and the first section is Receptacle of Souls. Uh, the second section is Conditions of the Departed. The third section is The Perfecting of Souls. And we're going to look a little bit further in to subsection 9. Um, so you may have a copy that is a condensed version that's a little bit different. I've got the full version in front of me. I'll put a link into the full version. Um, so that will be on page 83 if you're looking at that one. But if not, it'll be chapter 3, subsection 9. So we're kind of halfway through his treatment of purgatory. We don't have time to really read the whole thing. So we kind of pick up midstream. So he says, now we come to the double question as to whether our future purgation will be attended by pain and as to whether, if so, it is penal. So at this point, he's already covered a lot of the ground that Bicknell talked about in his commentary about the early Christian writers and their limited statements, uh, their view of um, the judgment um, pictured in 1 Corinthians, uh, judgment through fire as being a kind of purgatory. Um, he's already been through the prayer for the dead, which is commonplace, and a lot of the things that Bicknell covered. Now he's turning the attention more to those contested issues that come later with Augustine, with Gregory the Great, the more speculative things that, that basically the Roman or the Romish doctrine of purgatory is kind of known for. Um, and, and sometimes that gets really into an exaggeration and a caricature, kind of like a temporary hell that you've got to work your way out of. But he addresses these important themes and questions of will there be punishment, will, will there be pain, is it penal, uh, is it purgatorial, and so on. So we now come to the double question as to whether our future purgation will be attended by pain and as to whether, if so, it is penal. There is no indisputable evidence in Scripture of suffering after death for those who die in grace, in a state of salvation. On the contrary, the dominant aspect of the biblical hints concerning their state is that of rest, comfort, and peace. This appears in the Jewish book of wisdom. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and there shall no torment touch them. They are at peace. In our Lord's parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the latter is described as comforted, in contrast to the rich man's in torment. The same note of comfort is sounded in the assurance to the penitent thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. St. Paul speaks of desiring to depart and be with Christ, for it is far better. He is surely not claiming present perfection and a consequent prospect withheld from the faithful at large. There are indeed certain statements about which are thought to look the other way, but no one of them is certainly relevant. St. Paul says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. But he seems to have in view not the intermediate state, but what will happen it to the imperfect at the final judgment. That he uses the term fire, literally, is not susceptible of proof. Christ says that the servant who knowingly fails to make himself ready for the Lord's coming shall be beaten with many stripes, but he that, that knew not and did the things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So in other words, we don't take that literally. Why would we take the fire literally? But the scope of his warning includes those who sin willfully against light, to whom at least... Final salvation is certainly not offered, and the whole passage can be taken to refer to the different degrees of punishment in Gehenna, and to the longer and shorter delays of mitigation thereof. The intermediate state apparently is not in mind, nor does it seem to be referred to in our Lord's warning to him who fails in this world to agree with his adversary. 
Thou shalt by no means come out thence from prison till thou hast paid the last farthing. That's uh, Matthew 5, 26. Christ appears to be speaking of the last judgment, and the phrase until does not prove that he refers to a terminable period of imprisonment, unless it also proves that Joseph knew Mary after she had brought forth the holy child Jesus. Not the conclusion of those who use the text under, under the consideration of indicating purgatorial suffering. The doctrine of suffering in purgatory is plainly not divinely revealed, and in spite of its Western acceptance, has no ecumenical authority. That is, that's not necessarily the case in the Eastern Church's thought. It is purely speculative and is properly based upon rational inference from experience of the laws of moral development and in penal aspect from what this world's experience teaches us as to the requirements of justice. As a speculative opinion merely, we are free to believe in purgatorial suffering, provided our conception of such suffering does not in effect nullify the scriptural indications of comfort to be enjoyed by the faithful departed in the intermediate state. The mixture of joy and pain, which is, and this is a weird word, Hypotheticated, I think, imagined, speculate, speculated. Uh, the mixture of joy and pain, which is uh, hypotheticated, in St. Catherine of Genoa's description of purgatory, appears to fulfill this requirement. And St. Catherine really kind of stands out as, you might say, the Anglican among the Roman theologians about purgatory. Uh, so this mixture of joy and pain in St. In Catherine of Genoa's description of purgatory appears to fulfill this requirement and to agree with the, ne the, necess the necessary conditions of subjective purgation from the taint of sin, so as far as this world's experience enables us to determine them. So Catherine keeps in tension this idea of suffering, purification, and even penal restitution, with the idea, along the same time, of joy, comfort, peace, and so on. The vision of all the Holy Savior can hardly fail to cut through the complacency and fill us with the exquisite and intensified sorrow for the past, and the purging effect of his loving eye, as it penetrates our souls, can with difficult, difficulty be thought of as inflicting no pain. So, in other words, seeing Jesus has to be a bit painful on one side and joyful on the other. We shall perhaps then understand what growing pains are, with results lying beyond our present ken. But the absolute assurance of salvation from sin, the gratitude for the demonstration there afforded of God's pardoning love, and the realization that we are being made fit for eternal life with him, these things will fill us with joy unspeakable. The conception of purifying pain in the intermediate state was of slow development. In the meantime, no clear distinction was made by the ancients between purgative and penal suffering for the saved hereafter, and the early tendency was to attend chiefly to its penal aspect and to connect it with the day of final judgment. Therefore, when later speculation built up the idea of suffering for the imperfect subjects of salvation between death and the resurrection, the emphasis then placed upon penalties to be endured in purgatory, not wholly exclusive, but much greater than that upon the purification and growth, was in line with earlier speculation. That the belief in any form of suffering in the intermediate state was purely speculative we have already shown. The added description of such suffering as penal does not, of course, afford higher certainty to the doctrine, and it has no real evidence in its favor unless inferences from our imperfect earthly knowledge of the requirements of divine justice can be so regarded. So it is a logical deduction, not necessarily something that's divinely revealed. The proof, if it be such, is chiefly an appeal to analogy and not demonstrative. 
Nonetheless, we are free to be guided by such argument in speculative opinion concerning purgatory. And we seem to be led reasonably to the view that even the saved, pardon though they be, must pay the last farthing, a penalty for sin, before the scales of divine justice can be brought to their necessary final balance. The supposition that sufferings indicated by God are wholly reformatory and purificatory, ceasing when repentance is achieved, is not Christian. Interesting statement. It does not agree with the analogies of divine providence in this world. Divine forgiveness does not exempt us from suffering sufficiently for our sins. In other words, you can be forgiven. There's still consequences for your actions. If, therefore, a pardoned sinner, one suffering execution for murder, but dying penitent, to give a significant example, has not fully endured the requirements of divine penal justice, it is reasonable to think that he will suffer sufficient temporary penalties after death. And, and that kind of throws into light the whole question of, you know, can somebody just repent two seconds before they die and get into heaven? Yes, that doesn't mean they're getting away with stuff, you know. They may still have to have severe purgation, um, depending on who they are and what they've done and where the state of their soul is and so on. The more deeply we meditate upon the awfulness of sin and all its forms, the less inclined we shall be to confine our application of this argument to more conspicuous evildoers. It is not, it's not just for the really, really bad. It's also for the, all the normies, too. But a qualifying consideration already laid down in treatment of purgatory purgatorial suffering after death has to be safeguarded. That is, we must not so conceive of suffering in purgatory, whether purificatory or penal, as to nullify the scriptural description of the faithful departed as comforted and at peace. So we've got to keep these two things in tension. A second limitation is that we should not even seem to estimate the penalties for pardon sinned in quantitative terms as if each species of offense had a determined, determinate amount of punishment assigned to it, as in human criminal law. Divine justice takes all things into account and has preeminently a moral equation and personal character and view. So we can't just necessarily equate, you know, sentences in the criminal justice system with the way things work for the soul in the afterlife. These cannot be estimated rightly in quantitative or durational terms. The just punishment of a given sin will necessarily be governed in each several case by its punitive effect and significance for the individual involved. And this depends upon subjective uh, susceptibilities for which there can be no quantitative standard of measure. When divine justice has been sufficiently vindicated, punishment will end. True justice is not vindictive, Accordingly, the suggestion involved in granting so many days or years of indulgences from purgatorial penalties is clearly erroneous and harmful. And then we've mentioned this before, that the old system of indulgences was basically the commutation of ecclesiastical sentences in this life. And then gradually it kind of gets applied to the afterlife, but these, these you know, so many days, so many years off your sentence kind of gets carried over into the afterlife. And the Roman commentators on it say, remember, this is not to be taken literally, uh, but still it ends up kind of being, it ends up coloring the whole view of purgatory and indulgences. This granting of indulgences, interpreted though it be by theologians as meaning that the church pledges itself to pray for the relief of the souls in purgatory in whose behalf they are granted, has led to another erroneous supposition, that of a treasury of merits, which the Church's prayers can make available for reducing purgatorial penalties. Properly speaking, merits cannot be transferred, either in possession or in effect, from one person to another, and no saint's merits are personally superfluous in amount. 
The truth of this assertion is not weakened by our acknowledging, as we do, that holy souls have great power in prayer and in their interaction through the mystical body of Christ upon the souls of others. The prayers of the church for the departed are somehow, surely, useful. But their result in reducing the sufferings of souls in purgatory, if, as we think, there are such sufferings, cannot without misleading effect be expressed in the terms which we have been criticizing. The condemnation of the Romish doctrine concerning purgatory in our Articles of Religion seems to be directed against these terms, not against any and every form of belief in purgatory. The question remains, do the saints, when they become perfectly free from every taint and consequence of sin, and are entirely possessed of holy virtues, enjoy the vision of God? In other words, do they, in practical effect, enter heaven? Clearly, they do not enjoy the full consummation of their destined heavenly state, functions and blessedness, until they have been clothed upon at last day with their glorified resurrection bodies. So, in in at least a literal sense, salvation isn't finished. There's still a last stage left, which is the resurrection of the body and being rejoined with your body. The question is then, do they enjoy the beatific vision of God before this full beatification takes place. There is certainly no formal doctrine having ecumenical authority which determines the answer, and the teaching of Scripture is not conclusively clear. The question was not directly considered in apostolic days. We cannot make secure inferences from the use of the name paradise in apostolic and antinecine literature, for this use varied and often was not clearly defined. Moreover, we cannot have the certainty of faith as to the local uh, demarcation, if there be such, between the intermediate receptacles of saved souls after death and heaven. And this reduces the possibility of making sure inferences from apocalyptic pictures of the heavenly realm. Entrance into heaven may be a change of state, an enlargement of vision, rather than a local migration. St. Paul supposes that the faithful departed are with Christ from the outset, and heaven, in local description, is where Christ is locally present, the place of his bodily appearance. Whether St. Paul saw the beatific vision of God when transported into the third heaven, he does not say. In the Apocalypse, the saints see and worship Christ, but are not described as seeing God in his triune essence. All this indicates an interconnection between the place of the faithful departed and heaven, perhaps an absence of regional separation. So the moving from purgatory to heaven doesn't necessarily have to be a moving from one place to another, but rather a growth of maturity in Christ. The history of opinion on the subject need not detain us long. In the Antinicene period, several writers appear to deny that any can enter heaven before the consummation, before the resurrection. Others take the affirmative view, which gained increasing hold upon the church during the period of the ecumenical councils, and has continued to be the ruling belief on the subject both east and west to the present day. The 16th century Protestants and Reformers rejecting altogether, as they did the Catholic doctrine of an intermediate state, held that the saved enter heaven immediately after death. This radical view, a fruit of reaction, is now losing ground. Among Anglicans, many have shared the Protestant view. On the other hand, a considerable number of high churchmen, apparently influenced by desire to avoid both Roman and Protestant extremes, have stressed both the reality of an intermediate state of comfort for the faithful departed, and a postponement for all of entrance into heaven until the consummation. In recent days, however, Anglicans of the so-called Catholic group have usually fallen into line with the long-established traditional belief that the perfected saints now enjoy the beatific vision. The weight of its support and the argument of St. Thomas that the holy naturally gravitate to the holiest, 
along with the entire absence of evidence to the contrary, lead us, that is, Francis Hall, to adopt this opinion, that is, speculatively. So we can't know this from divine revelation, only speculation, only theological opinion, but it seems to be sound, seems to be most reasonable that, yes, after this time of purgatorial maturity is completed, that the saints do enjoy fully the beatific vision, even though there is one final step left in the process of their salvation, which is the resurrection of the body. So he says that he holds that position, but there can be no dogmatic certainty. It's left to the area of speculation and opinion. And then wrapping up his chapter, he says, The conclusions at which we have arrived are as follows. A. That there is an intermediate state after death for the preparation of saved souls for heaven is assured by Catholic doctrine. So that's the one big certainty, that there's no soul sleep, there's no immediate heaven after death, there's an intermediate state between now and then. B, that the purification and perfecting of these souls involves some degree of pain. Such pain as is consistent with their being comforted seems highly probable, but is not clearly revealed. C, that these souls have to endure penal sufferings in order to complete the satisfaction of divine justice also seems probable, though in less degree. Purification and penal sufferings need not be thought of as separable. So there, there can be overlap there. The distinction may be one of aspects simply. And finally, D, that perfected saints see God before their full beatification at the last day seems probable. So that is Francis Hall's take on the Anglican view about purgatory and the intermediate state. I think we'll have one more uh, session on the topic. Um, so next time we'll look at other outside views. We'll see what the Orthodox view is. And also um, kind of the Protestant view that seems to be open to this idea of the intermediate state and some active growing and maturity in such an intermediate state. So stay tuned next time. Um, I hope everyone, if you're traveling next week for Thanksgiving gatherings, please uh, have safe travels and God bless and uh, we'll see you.